Next, I'm honored to introduce this year's, health, uh, this year's keynote speaker, Mr. Alfred E. Mann. I don't know if we've mentioned, but our student teams really choose their own projects. Professor Allen and Professor Acharya guide them toward our two key criteria. These are the two criteria that our students pick their projects, clinical impact and commercial viability. There's organizations which do one or the other, but CIVIT is unique in that it really insists on both of these. I can't think of a keynote speaker that better epitomizes both of these criteria, clinical impact and commercial viability. Al Mann is one of the most successful medical device developers in our time. His work now spanning five decades and counting has saved lives and improved health care for patients around the world in an astonishing range of clinical areas, from cardiology to metabolic diseases to the restoration of sight, hearing, and motor function. His work also spans an amazing range, an amazing range of techno technological and scientific domains, from neurostimulation to drug delivery to now pharmaceuticals. The details of many of Alman's companies are described in the program and invite the participants, especially the students, to read and be inspired by that, that track record. You'll notice a few themes as you read through that. Al Mann not only creates the companies, but he also manages, manages them to ensure their success. He sticks around even after they've been acquired for a long period of time. All of his companies are also based on innovative, paradigm-shifting approaches, such as one of my favorites, Advanced Bionics. When Al Mann finds an area of technology lacking in the demanding performance requirements for medical devices, he won't accept the status quo. He'll create a company or buy a company and develop it to address that need, like he did with Qualion in the case of batteries and in the case of uh, stellar microelectronics for high performance uh, microcircuit assemblies. Despite being very successful on the business side, he has never rested. It's a true sign of a person with a passion for healthcare innovation. Today, Al Mann directs his talents to addressing one of the major healthcare challenges of our time diabetes with his creation and leadership of Mankind Corporation. Its lead product mimics the insulin kinetics of a normal pancreas. Once again, a new therapy paradigm. In addition to commercial pursuits, Al Mann also leads the Alfred Mann Foundation and has established the Al Mann Institutes at USC, Purdue, and the Technion. He holds a BA and MS degrees in physics from UCLA and honorary doctorates from USC, Western University, Technion, and the Johns Hopkins University. Al Mann is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Despite being trained as a physicist, we're honored to have you as one of us, a biomedical engineer. Mr. Alfred Mann. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Yardi, and thank you, Dr. Daniels, and, and to all my colleagues here, and to Dr. Miner, and I'd like to especially say, if I may, something about Dr. Naparco, because he is one of the gems of the world today, and he shares our passion for making lives better. And, and I have to say something to you, sir, Dr. Daniels. I am not going to work for another 40 years. I've set my retirement date. I'm going to retire on, Jan on July 1st, 2047. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, she says. Um, you know, you spoke of the uh, of the the benefits of what we do for people, and that's really what drives us. And you ought to make that your primary goal, because it turns out that the greatest reward of all is not the money or not the acclaim or none of that. It's being able to make life better for people because. People are coming up to me all of the time and telling me that this device or that device or this product that I've uh, been involved in has changed their lives. And it is really the most rewarding thing of all. So how do we get there? Or what is the way that we create a product? First of all, let me say that uh, I, I uh, Johns Hopkins has played an enormous role in my career. In fact, I would never have gotten involved in medical products if it were not for Johns Hopkins. Uh, in fact, they were very instrumental in my early career, and we'll talk a little bit about what uh, some of the things I've done. Uh, but one of the problems that faces us all is how do you transform a product, how do you build a company, 
These are challenges which are not so obvious. And one of the issues, of course, is that we see in our elite universities, our elite research universities, enormous uh, technology that's being developed that has great application. And yet these products rarely get to market. Uh, the technologies never get into products even. How do we somehow transform the uh, science and the technology into products that will make a difference in people's lives? That's the challenge we face. And I'd like to speak a little about it because I think that it's something that's lost today. We try to create these new spin-off ventures in the universities, and it hasn't really worked very well. I've tried to create these institutes, uh, which are really industrial development organizations built on a university campus to try to get the, take the technology of the university and try to create products with it. It, I think the jury's still out as to whether that's going to really work. Uh, I've, I've created three of them so far. I, I want to create about a dozen. Uh, they, are, uh, they are institutes that, I, that I've endowed with about $100 million, although it, that's the minimum. At USC it's now $163 million. But the whole idea is to try to find a way of bridging the so-called valley of death. Uh, where so many companies fail. And why do they fail? Well, let's talk about what's important in creating a company. And I, uh, I you know, I, I'm, I've, I've had uh, the, uh, the pleasure of being uh, fairly successful in my career, so, uh, so I'm often asked to talk about what it is that's made, given me the success. Uh, and, and I start sometimes by saying, what are the most important things you need uh, in creating a successful company? And I go back to the time when I was uh, first uh, created my first company, and I went to my boss, and, uh, and uh, because I was going to use technology I had developed uh, at at, uh, at my employment, and I asked his permission, and I also uh, asked for his advice. And he said, "Well, the first thing you do, if you're going to start a company, he said, figure out how much money you're going to need." double it and don't go into business unless you have thrice that. And so what I say to you is the most important ingredient of a successful business is having enough capital. But it's not just having enough capital, you really have to have enough capital. So the second thing you need to do is have enough capital. Uh, and well, you think that's funny, but I'm telling you that most companies fail because they don't have enough capital. So the third thing on my list is you gotta have enough capital. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> but it's not just capital. As I said, I'm gonna list the, most, the 10 most important ingredients and all 10 of my capital. You need to, to, you need to have vision, you need to have inspiration, you need to have leadership. And I don't mean management, you need leadership that can to drive the people, to get them to buy into what you're trying to achieve. So you need leadership, but you do have to manage it, so you have to have management. But you can't just have a company and have leadership and management, you have people, so you've got to have people. And I mean really good people. Don't ever squander, uh, I mean don't ever doubt the fact that you need to have good people. A one good person, you know, people sometimes say, how come that in this company or that company, uh, we've uh, done so much with uh, maybe a tenth of the number of people that some big corporation has. Why have we succeeded? Part of the reason is because we always try to hire great people, get them to buy into the vision. What is the vision? You need good people that share the vision, are committed, loyal, and ethical people who have the credibility that, that is necessary to make your company successful. So again, I say people, but now you start talking about the business, and you've you got to sell it, and frankly, selling is more important than almost anything else, because nothing sells itself, not even a better mousetrap. So um, marketing, I say, is the first and most important part of the business itself. Manufacturing, of course, you have to manufacture products, and if you're talking about medical products, you've got to have products of quality, so that's a major challenge. And finally, the tenth item on my list is the product. 
Now, isn't that strange for someone who grew up as a scientist? Uh, why I put product as the last item? Well, even perhaps the most, the most uh, uh, interesting phenomenon is the, I say, what does it take to make a great product? And I list 10 things to make a great product. Uh, and interestingly, um, the last item is the idea. It's not all of the stuff that goes into to doing it is really more important than just the idea itself. And, and that's sort of strange. And, and so someone uh, came to me one day and said, what is it uh, that, is, that is your approach? Why is it different from what other people do? And I thought about it, and I sort of created a, uh, a, a, uh, a sort of an answer that's like this. Most people find uh, a technology and then try to find a, a purpose for that technology, an application of that technology. Uh, and, and that's sort of the, the general plan. And, and I must say that I've done that a few times. Uh, but really, I do the opposite. I try to take on a technical challenge in an area uh, where you have an untapped, fast-growing market with very few competitors looking for an unmet need, an unmet or poorly met need, and then try to address that market with technology, try to find the technology, not find the application with the technology. I sort of turn the whole, uh, the whole approach around, and that's probably one of the most significant uh, aspects of, of uh, what I've done in my career. Uh, and, and also, I'm very patient. Uh, most people don't look for, uh, for uh, uh, success in, in, in 10 years. They look for success in three years or five years. I've been involved in things for 10 to 15 years before I've achieved success. I'll tell you about one of my programs today. It's 13 years and $1.5 billion, and I'm still not quite there. So uh, you've got to have uh, patience, you've got to have persistence, and understanding uh, of, of what it takes to get there and to be patient with your people. So uh, how is it that you go about creating a, a product? Well, I say the most important thing is to go find something that's an unmet or poorly met need, something that has significance in people's lives if you're talking about uh, medical devices or medical products, uh, select the market first, <clears throat> then try to find out exactly what it is that's underserved. Why is it underserved? Why is it an unmet need or poorly met need? And you ne need to talk to the clinicians and so forth and really understand uh, the issues. <clears throat> then you have to look at the barriers to entry. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, you mentioned uh, advanced bionics earlier and uh, what we did in cochlear implants. Uh, uh, we, uh, we didn't really do it so much there, but when we tried to diversify that company, we looked at 8,300 patents, narrowed it down, studied the patents until we got it down to maybe half a dozen that we really studied thoroughly to make sure. And it's difficult today, uh, although in some respects it's easier because now patents are published after 18 months, so you get a chance to see uh, what's going on. But there's still 18 months of, uh, of development, and there's so much going on, uh, particularly at our universities today, and also in companies, that you don't know what's going on in that 18-month period, or even before they start filing the patents. So you need to understand the, uh, the intellectual property challenges, the regulatory challenges, the reimbursement challenges, those are issues that you need to deal with. <clears throat> then, once you've gone through all of this and you've decided, yes, there's a need and, and there is a, a, an opportunity, there's no barrier to entry, and, and there's a, a market that is supportable and, and with reimbursement and all of those things, then you sit down and write out a very detailed product specification. Now you're really starting in the development. And you create a business model. And if that business model makes sense, then you go forward. Unless it does, you're better off dropping it. Then you have to apply the resources and make sure you don't skimp on those. 
and I mean from all across the spectrum. You need engineering, you need the, the, the scientists, the engineering, you need the manufacturing, the quality, the marketing, the financial, uh, all of these uh, different uh, uh, technologies and specialties are needed uh, as you begin to form the plan. And then uh, you have to organize, once you get the product pretty well developed, uh, then you organize the sales and uh, marketing and reimbursement and support infrastructure and don't ever underestimate the infrastructure you need in a, in a medical product. <clears throat> then once you get the product developed, fully developed, then you have to validate it, qualify, qualify it and uh, transfer it to manufacturing, go through all of the regulatory uh, issues and the clinical trials and all of that's necessary to get there. And finally, when it's all done, then you unleash the sales and marketing. It's a major program. Today, to develop a medical product is usually a five to seven or eight year project. Rarely do you get it done in three or four years, although it's possible in some simple products. In medical devices, it's typical today, it takes 12 to 15 years in, in, in I'm sorry, in a drug, uh, and a billion and a half dollars to get there. It's crazy. The world is nuts, and the, and the FDA is destroying innovation uh, and progress in medicine today. And, uh, but that's something you have to deal with uh, because uh, the, uh, the agency today is so risk averse, it's easy for a, for a bureaucrat to say no, it's not so easy to say yes. If he says yes and there's a mistake, then he loses his job or loses his potential. If he says no, nobody cares. And so uh, it, it becomes a very difficult program today. So all that said, let me, uh, let me simply say that uh, I'm going to go through, talk a little bit about some of the things I've done. Uh, these are uh, most of the companies I've done in my life. And I'll talk a little bit first about how I started. <clears throat> I was a young scientist working uh, in electro-optical physics when, uh, when the, uh, the Army came to me and they needed help. Uh, and I wasn't in a position to do anything for them. So I listened to their problem and I gave some advice. They went to the vendor, couldn't do it, and the Army called me one day and said, uh, Mr. Mann, he says, if you won't do this, we won't have an anti-tank weapon system in this country and we're having to fire these couple of thousand people. You've got to do this for your country. So they said, we'll give you a contract, set you up in business. So I said, that's an interesting idea. I, mean, I didn't know anything about business. They sent a contracting officer over to my uh, over to me and, uh, you know, I had no equipment, I had no facility, I knew nothing. Uh, and, uh, but I knew there was some equipment across town that somebody had bought that they didn't, couldn't buy anybody to run. I had to create a vacuum system with all this uh, technology inside of it. Uh, I had to do something sort of at the state of the art. Uh, and in, and uh, uh, I figured I could probably do it and I'd do that and then maybe I'd go back because I never finished my, uh, my uh, my doctorate research project, so I figured I did everything else, but I thought I'd go back and, and get my doctorate afterwards, but I'd do this for a year or two. That was my plan, so I said, all right, I'll do it. <clears throat> they sent over a contracting officer, and, uh, you know, I was a scientist, I knew nothing about business, and uh, so he said, I don't need a proposal from you, he said, but we need to have a quotation. So I said, what's that? Uh, so he said, well, you figure out who's going to work on the project, what their hourly pay is, how many hours they're going to do, and you extend that and add this and add that and add 10% profit, that's your bid. Well, this was in 1956. Dollars were different then. I gave him a quotation. I was going to do something that probably should have taken four years. I said I'd do it in four months. Uh, and, and I gave him a quotation of $11,200. <laughs> <laughs> That's maybe three hundred thousand dollars in today's dollars, but you know it was uh, uh, it was uh, for me it was a lot of money. I started my first company with three thousand dollars, and I borrowed eighteen thousand dollars from my family, and and so that was the start of what became a company called Spectralab, <clears throat> and we uh, we we got going. And I'll tell you a story afterwards, but I'll bridge the difference. We we when I got in the in the the pacemaker business. Uh, and that was, by the way, through Johns Hopkins. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, Hopkins, when we had made our first implant on February 10th, 1973, Hopkins published a big, uh, had a big press release and everything because they were involved with us. 
in that development, and, uh, uh, and there was a, a publication in Forbes magazine and Fortune. We were the company that was going to overtake Medtronic. Uh, who had already uh, was the dominant in the pacemaker business, and <clears throat> we had the technology. And so, uh, so somebody came to me and wanted to in, uh, buy or invest in our company. It was a, a, a middle-sized pharmaceutical company called Searle, uh, G.D. Searle, who most known because they created Splenda. Uh, but uh, anyway, Searle was trying to diversify into medical devices. And it turned out that that uh, that the guy that was running that program, their vice president, was that army contracting officer back in 1956. And uh, uh, we became good friends, and uh, Ralph Goodwin was his name. We went out to dinner one night, and we were talking, uh, and he told me, he says, you know, he started chuckling. He said, what's so funny, Ralph? He says, well, uh, in that first contract where you gave me a quote of $11,000, the Army gave me a direct order, you get this guy under contract no matter what. Uh, and here's an authorization, if you need more, come back, we'll find it somewhere. And in his pocket was $500,000. <laughs> People have said that's the last time I left money on the table. Though. <laughs> anyway, that was uh, sort of the start, uh, and I created uh, Healy, uh, what happened is somebody left the Army program, went to the Air Force that was trying to do, uh, they, were, uh, they were running the ballistic missile program for the Air Force, uh, and they came to me in 1958, I guess it was, and said, because uh, I'd solved, it turned out I'd solved a lot of problems on the Army program and uh, did it cheap, inexpensively and quickly, and uh, so they came to me and said, Al, we want to fly a spacecraft, and we want to power with solar cells, which had just been invented by Bell Laboratories. Uh, but when they get hot, they lose their efficiency. Do I have a way of making them run cooler? So, well, maybe I can lower the alpha epsilon ratio, lower the absorption, and increase the emissivity. They gave me a little order. I made some samples. They worked, and I got involved in, in our first spacecraft. It turned out uh, that it, it didn't work very. Uh, the, the people who were making the uh, the, the cells didn't do a very good job, and ultimately I, I, uh, I created the solar arrays uh, for the very first spacecraft, and I powered, I, I thought I only did about 100 spacecraft, but Bob Fischel yesterday, uh, who was at APL, said that I did 50 pace spacecraft just for APL. So somewhere is a, a, maybe 150 pace, uh, spacecraft I worked on, uh, did one of the lunar experiments, did a lot of things at Spectralab and Helitech, which was a semiconductor company I created that uh, made mostly uh, solar cells. And, and then uh, much later, uh, trying to do medical devices, I created Qualion because we didn't, couldn't find batteries safe enough to put in human bodies. Uh, and they now make the very finest rechargeable and some primary batteries, uh, mostly for the military and aerospace now, I we started it for medical products. Uh, and also trying to get people to make reliable microcircuit assemblies was always a, a challenge for us. I had a chance a few years ago to buy a little, uh, a small uh, a company that was going to be closed down uh, in microelectronics, and so I, I acquired that, built it up, and now it's now one of my most successful companies, uh, in, at least in revenue today, uh, and it's doing a great job in stellar microelectronics. Those are my aerospace companies, but let me talk a little bit about the others. The pacemaker program started with, uh, uh, with Hopkins. What happened here uh, is that um, uh, in uh, 19, like in sort of 1967, eight time frame, the president of Hopkins at that time was Milton Eisenhower, the president's brother, uh, and Frank McClure was the assistant head of the laboratory uh, of APL. Uh, and they were trying to figure out how to apply the advanced engine, uh, engineering and manufacturing technologies of the military and aerospace program uh, to solve medical uh, problems here for the medical school. Uh, so, uh, so they started a program and doctors would come in and talk about their issues. One of the doctors, a fellow named Kenneth Lewis, said, pacemakers last 18 to 21 months, or 21 months. there's got to be a better way. And one of the engineers in the, in the audience was uh, Robert Fischel, and he saw some advertisement about some company making a battery that would last in the pacemaker for 14 months. 
Uh, and so he said, there's a better way. So he said, let's make a rechargeable pacemaker. And so we created up in the upper right, uh, that was our first pacemaker that we made. Uh, it had a lot of revolutionary things that we did. Uh, and that was the beginning of a company called Pacesetter Systems. Uh, and then I was trying to diversify it. Uh, so then uh, you see the progression. Today, pace, pacemakers are about a half an ounce and uh, have a lot of technology in them. But uh, 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 that uh, company, which was Pacesetter Systems, is now St. Jude Medical. Uh, it's the number two pacemaker company in the world. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I was trying to diversify the company, and I, uh, I created a list of uh, possible applications of our technology. And one of them is, well, let's, let's uh, maybe make a, 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 an insulin pump. And so I created a program uh, to develop insulin pumps and then glu continuous glucose sensors. Uh, and that company became uh, Minimed and, uh, in uh, 2000. And uh, it, it's another interesting story. Um, what happened is that uh, there were several companies that developed as uh, competitors over the, uh, over the next decade. And there was a company trying to get in the business, one of the major corporations, and they created a pump that wasn't very good. They killed five people in a clinical trial, and that was the end of insulin pumps. Everybody else quit the market except Minimed. We proceeded in 2001. We sold the company for, with a small affiliate doing the artificial pancreas, by the way, uh, for over $4, $4 billion. It's, uh, it's about a $2 billion business uh, uh, market today, uh, and uh, Medtronic's doing very well with it, in spite of the fact you don't have a Medtronic pump, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, the point is that uh, pumps are gonna be obsolete pretty soon anyway, and I'll show you why. <laughs> um, so let's go on. Uh, some of the other, one of the other things, the next pro, uh, company I developed uh, or founded was a company called Advanced Bionics. Uh, what happened is after, when I sold the pacemaker business in 1985, um, uh, the company that acquired it was the company that had the problem with the, uh, the failed pumps, uh, with pump runaway, and uh, they weren't going to touch pumps for one second, so we spun it off, and, uh, and now I have another company uh, which became Minimed, uh, making the insulin pumps and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, I had created also a, a foundation, and the foundation was run by a guy named Joe Shulman. Uh, and uh, Joe is a very, uh, very uh, great guy. I, mean, I hired him in 69, he still works for me today. Uh, but uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he hired a fellow uh, he came to an NIH meeting and hired a, a young engineer who uh, uh, had worked at the very fledgling research program at the University of California, San Francisco. He came in and saw the technology at the foundation, saw the technology at Pacesetter and at Minimed. He said, you got to do the cochlear implant. And I said, who the hell wants to do a cochlear implant? I um, mean, you're talking about uh, something, uh, people, uh, the early cochlear implants, uh, were described as aids to lip reading or sign language. Uh, quality was very poor. There was a report by Frost and Sullivan, a big marketing organization, saying that the worldwide market for cochlear implants was probably going to be 330 units a year. So who the hell wants to do this? So I turned it down, and they come back every couple of months and say, you got to do this, you got to do this. Finally, uh, Dr. Schindler, the head of the program at UCSF, came in with a videotape of their very crude system, uh, and they show this woman who's totally deaf talking on a telephone. I got tears streaming out. All right, I'll do the damn cochlear implant. But I wasn't going to make a company out of it. I was going to develop and then find someone to commercialize it. Uh, so that was the start. Uh, but before I go into the details of that, because that's sort of an interesting story, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll reserve that and talk about it in a few minutes. Uh, but first let me go on some of the other companies. Uh, we were trying to advance and diversify uh, advanced bionics, the cochlear implant company, and I created neuromodulation programs. Uh, and when, uh, but uh, we then went on to do peripheral uh, nerve simulation in a company called Bioness. We have several products there. Uh, uh, to give you an idea, here's just a, 
uh, a video of, <clears throat> of one of the uh, of, a, of a patient uh, uh, with the an external you see how he walks on the left very very hard to walk now you see how he walks on the right with the uh, uh, with our device um, it, it changes people's lives is just one of the things we do not only in planted devices we also do I mean external device we also do implanted devices that's bioness um, we also created something that has a lot of interesting application. Uh, we, people have tried for decades to create a, uh, a port, a viable port that enables you to take something out of the body or into the body without the, uh, the danger of infection. And uh, we, in, in another program we were working on, we actually created uh, a, such a viable port technology. The first application we had, had done with it was <laughs> Uh, to create a, a port for dialysis so you don't have to keep putting new things in all the time. And another thing I said, we created uh, uh, hearing, actually our, our hearing, which I'll describe in a minute, and Dr. Naparco uh, can, uh, can tell you, uh, we create now for young children not only the ability to hear words, and, and it's no longer just a, an aid to sign language or lip reading, we actually create good enough hearing that the, the children are able to enjoy music even and all sorts of things. It's, it's amazing what we've done. I said, if we can do this for people who are deaf and we're doing the other devices for people who, who are lame, well, why can't we do something for people who are blind? So we've created a, a visual prosthesis where we simulate the retina. That, by the way, is also tied in with, uh, by, uh, with, uh, by, uh, with uh, Johns Hopkins because the team that came out of, uh, of Hopkins and came out uh, to uh, talk with me and we created a company called Second Sight. Uh, we have a product uh, which is not, doesn't provide great sight, but people can live uh, reasonably well with it and, uh, and function. And uh, I, I tell this story about the first, uh, the first generation device which we weren't intending to commercialize. And uh, one of the, the second patient had an accident uh, she fell and she hit her, uh, her planted eye on the corner of a table and uh, we had to go and replace this, uh, the, the, the device by surgery again. And it was fascinating uh, because uh, when she fell, she tripped because she, when she was cleaning house. She was a, a blind woman cleaning house. Not so bad. So uh, it gives you an idea of some of the things that uh, that uh, are very inspiring when you see what you can do for someone and uh, while what we're giving is not really good uh, sight, uh, it's adequate sight. So uh, that's second sight. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit, most of the things I've done uh, are in, <coughs> in uh, medical devices, uh, but uh, uh, when I was at Minimed I learned a lot about diabetes uh, and I realized that the biggest problem is that the kind of insulin you use in a pump for, uh, if, uh, that you need for, uh, for dealing with the glucose that you eat. Remember, you have two sources of glucose, uh, what you eat and then your liver feeding your body between meals. Uh, but the, the insulin you, you eat uh, at uh, mealtime isn't good enough. And you can never really get excellent normal control uh, with the insulins that exist today. Uh, so I came across some technology uh, 13 years ago uh, that was able to stabilize uh, large molecules. And the problem with insulin is that to make a stable insulin, they have six molecules that are bound together with a couple of zinc atoms, uh, and the body can't use that hexamer. It has to break it down into monomers, uh, and that takes time. And I'll show you a few things, but what we have is a technology when you have diabetes, you have this little cartridge you put in for a meal. You, uh, you don't have to even titrate it, by the way. You don't do all that programming I just saw you doing. You just take this and go every time you have a meal and you have normal glucose. And with type 1, you, have a, uh, you can't have quite the latitude. Uh, but you don't have to do the detailed carbohydrate counting and all that you have to do. So it's really quite fascinating. If you look here, the yellow curve on the left, this is the insulin concentration in the blood. 
Uh, you see, uh, see that in the gray curve uh, is, the, uh, is what you see with the same insulin if you deliver it by uh, in the conventional sense that you, if you go buy it at the store and, and inject it, that's what it looks like. Totally different kinetic profile. On the right you see the dynamics and you see we cut down uh, the peak by a factor, the area under the curve by a factor of roughly two or more. Uh, but most importantly, the, the gray curve is actually plunging down towards uh, hypoglycemia, uh, and that's the big problem with uh, diabetes. Because it gets so, you, you have to, you have this risk of hypoglycemia, you have to raise the fasting glucose level up to a point where you can't get good, uh, a good control. And, and that's the challenge in diabetes today. <clears throat> And this shows you uh, uh, the, a little more. This is our drug in yellow. Uh, the, uh, the next curve over uh, is the, the, the fast-acting analogs that exist today. And then the dotted curve is what you get with regular insulin. It's a totally different profile. It's that difference. We mimic what the actual pancreas does. We peak in 12 to 14 minutes in the blood. Uh, and it's essentially gone in three hours. And that's what you need, because you, you digest a meal in roughly three hours. You don't want the insulin afterwards. It's that insulin that hangs on after you've digested the meal that causes almost all of the problems with insulin therapy. It causes uh, hyperinsulinemia. The hyperinsulinemia causes hypoglycemia, because the hypoglycemia, you have to get the fasting level up. In the meantime, you're, you're eating snacks all day, and your liver is pumping out uh, glucose to keep you from going into a coma, and, and that's uh, what causes all the weight gain with diabetes. It's, it's, just, it's just a pyramid that just starts and goes on forever because you don't have a good prandial insulin. And that's what we're doing with what we call a freset. <clears throat> so what we do is we reduce postprandial excursions almost to nothing. Uh, you have uh, uh, hardly any risk of hypoglycemia from our drug, but since you have to have a, a fasting a basal insulin, there is still some risk of uh, hypoglycemia. There's no complex meal titration. In type 2 diabetes, you don't have to titrate at all. In type 1, you have to have some modest uh, uh, level of, con of consideration. If you eat a huge meal, you need a second dose. Uh, but you don't need to do the complex titration you have otherwise. Uh, <clears throat> and there's no real weight gain. And uh, you don't have to, if you don't need to measure your I mean, if you don't need to titrate your, your mealtime insulin, you don't need to do all the glucose measurements that you do. So even though I, I was a, the guy that created uh, continuous glucose sensing, frankly, uh, that's going to be less important in the future. <clears throat> Basal control? Pardon? Basal control? Well, you need to do a little, yeah. Uh, but you don't need to do the level that you do today. <clears throat> and, and of course, uh, you don't have any injections. Uh, from mealtime control, but you do have to have uh, control of your, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of your basal insulin. Uh, so, uh, so you need to have uh, uh, one or two injections a day if you, if you go with that route. And so let's talk a little bit about advanced bionics. I sort of skipped over it. Uh, advanced bionics is um, a company that started developing cochlear implants. These work by stimulating the cochlea, the auditory nerve in the cochlea. Uh, here's the system that we created. On the left, you see uh, the external device, which uh, is a, 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 you have a microphone at the tip, uh, that little at the far end, and then uh, uh, the sound is processed in the, in the thing that goes behind the ear, and then it transmits in that, uh, in that little uh, round section, uh, transmits it to the device internal to the, uh, to the body, uh, which is in the middle section, and then the lead goes into the inner ear uh, and, uh, and, and uh, stimulates uh, the auditory nerve to create uh, the impulses which are interpreted by the brain as sound. <clears throat> of course, neuromodulation uh, covers all of the body, not just the ear, uh, and uh, some of the things that people do uh, are, are listed here with uh, you know, the bodies and electromechanical or elect electrochemical system, I mean, so uh, you can use drugs to deal with some of these things, but you can also use stimulation, electrical stimulation. These are some of the applications that people are looking at for a new modulation. Uh, but back uh, in the days, the early days of uh, advanced bionics, I said, 
It's, it's hard for me to see that this could be a successful standalone company with nothing else. We need to diversify the company. We could do hearing aids, but we, as, as uh, a company doing high rel implantable devices, we could never compete uh, in a commercial market like hearing aids. Uh, so I said, that doesn't make sense. So I said, the other direction we could go is after all, this is the most sophisticated uh, neurostimulator day, so let's do n uh, neurostimulators. Uh, and so we looked at the market and we found uh, that the, the largest market at the time uh, was spinal cord stimulations to eliminate chronic pain. Uh, and so we looked at that and we, as I said, we started studying it. Uh, we found that it was an unmet uh, or a poorly met need. The devices were relatively crude. They hadn't advanced for a decade. Uh, they, were, uh, they weren't really doing what the doctors needed. They didn't last very long. Uh, and uh, there were all sorts of issues with it. It was very hard to, get, to even find out uh, how to program to find this, this place on the spinal cord that, re that relates to the parts of the body that were in pain. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, so we created a device called Precision <clears throat> that in the first year captured about 25% of the market. This was really unusual because we were a company that nobody even knew we existed. Nobody knew our management. But we created the system that really revolutionized uh, that market. Uh, and uh, uh, that gets me then to the study. I quickly, uh, this was uh, uh, some of the uh, software programs that we used. And we also created uh, uh, in my foundation a little buy-on which we, t we uh, licensed some of the applications. This is a little neural stimulator complete with battery, bi-directional telemetry and everything. Uh, that was a uh, uh, something we developed and then we licensed that, created a whole neuromodulation operation and since we're doing neuromodulation we even included a pain pump uh, it, and uh, <clears throat> I went it in 2004, I went uh, to see a couple of companies uh, uh, to see if I could get them interested in, in licensing uh, certain applications for this device uh, and uh, one of them was Boston Scientific and uh, I went to them and tried to get them to do urinary incontinence. Uh, and they came to me about a week later, three of their executives, and they said, we want to buy your company. And I said, oh, it's much too early. It's not for sale. I sales the prior year. We only had one of the four products on the market, uh, and that was the cochlear implant. And I said, all these others uh, are not ready yet, so, you know, it's much too early to sell a company. Uh, they said, well, we want to buy it. And I said, well... Uh, let me show you. So I gave them a, pro a projection showing the, uh, the projection of these four products coming to market uh, and uh, uh, over 10 years and, and, I, and this was something we prepared for the board of directors. Uh, so I said, what's the company worth in 2009 or 10? And they said, well, if you can do that, it's probably worth five, five and a half billion dollars. And I said, so why should we sell it now? <clears throat> So I said, well, we'll make it worth your while. And they cooked up the craziest you could ever imagine. Uh, uh, I mean, I still marvel at it, except uh, uh, what they did is they paid us far more than the company was worth at the time, like probably a factor of two or three times. And then every year, uh, as, we, uh, uh, as we increased revenues, they gave us three times the increase in revenues. Uh, plus $100 million bonuses every time we got to different levels. So you put the whole thing together and they were going to pay us over nine and a half years something over $4 billion for a company that was doing $57 million. Didn't make any sense. But it was even more crazy than that. <clears throat> they, we didn't even report to them. Uh, we had, um, uh, we reported to a board of directors and we had half the people. Uh, on the board. <clears throat> and they said, we, don't, we want you to spend more money on R&D, uh, more than we could afford. So it was a deal made in heaven, we thought, so of course we took the deal. <clears throat> the first year and a half was really a honeymoon. And then they bought Guidant Corporation, uh, which was the, an, another major uh, uh, cardiovascular and pacemaker or defibrillator company. Uh, and the company went into a tailspin they ran into all sorts of issues. Their big, the reason they were doing all this was because they had a, a stent uh, that they were making that had a huge, like a 90% gross margin. Uh, and so they, had, they, was a money, uh, they were coining money, they had to spend it. 
and that's why they tried to do this deal. Um, but they got into trouble, and you know, it was a company that uh, was once uh, a high flyer, and their stock was selling for thirty-six dollars. It's now like six and a half dollars or so, uh, and they have six million dollars of debt on the books. It's really a a, 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 a disaster. Um, well, anyway, they came to us after the guidance thing and said, Al, uh, we need to change. We need to cut out some of this work you're doing. And I said, but it's written into the contract. You can't just cut it out. I said, I wouldn't agree to it unless 90% of We had 800 shareholders because all of our employees were shareholders and so forth. I said, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't agree to it unless you had 90% of the... Uh, of the minority shareholders to agree to it. Uh, and of course that wasn't going to happen, so it, they went away uh, uh, because I wasn't going to agree to it. Uh, and then a few months later they came to me and said, Al, we're going to do it anyway. And I said, you can't. And they said, we'll give you three days to agree. Well, in the fourth day at 8 o'clock in the morning we filed a lawsuit, the judge agreed with us, and then we sat down and we worked out a deal where we bought back two of the companies uh, two of the product lines, they kept two of them, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, and then we proceeded, uh, and uh, interestingly, last uh, uh, December 30th, we sold the, uh, the Coker implant business, because again, I don't think as a standalone company it makes a lot of sense. You need to have more, uh, more product uh, opportunity, and so that was what we ended up doing. Uh, we joined a company in the hearing aid business, one of the leaders in that business, and I think it's a, an opportunity to, to really create something of value for advanced bionics. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the last of the sequels are that, of course, uh, Boston Scientific, uh, you don't get away with uh, all that failure, and uh, Wall Street is very unforgiving, uh, and so the management of that company is gone, and the new management said, you know, we're a cardiovascular company, what are we doing with all this other stuff? Even though it's the fastest growing part of the company, they said, we can't deal with it, and so uh, they put up uh, the two neural divisions, ours, the one that they got from us, and one other one they put up on the market today, and they're gonna sell that. So all of this was done, and, and, but uh, of course, they didn't pay us $4 billion, because we, we, we bought it out early, so they, they only, uh, we only paid them, uh, they only paid us $2.7 billion, but that wasn't so bad. <laughs> so that said, let me just say in summary uh, that the, the problem you face uh, is uh, that, uh, that we learned a lesson from this. If a deal is too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Uh, and um, uh, we spent about $5 million on the litigation we won. Uh, but that's uh, a painful uh, way to do business, uh, and I suggest to you that uh, don't ever try to be too greedy. That was a, a deal. We didn't, we didn't ask for the money. They offered it to us, but it was, it was too good a deal to, to, uh, for them to have done. Uh, be reasonable, uh, and uh, uh, remember that your primary objective has got to be to do what's right for the people, for the patients. Uh, if you do that and do it well, uh, then maybe, uh, maybe you can achieve a degree of, uh, of pleasure and maybe some financial rewards. Uh, that said, uh, I want to thank you all uh, and uh, uh, hope to you all have great success. <clears throat> Al Mann has generously offered some time to have some Q&A, so if you'd like to uh, ask some questions, there's some microphones uh, at the Mr. Man, uh, can you uh, light on the Al Mann Institutes and what do you want to accomplish there and what are the, some of the, uh, the value of that, you know, there are the universities try to commercialize that technology and I know that one of the efforts of the Al Mann Institutes are to translate those technologies. So where do you see the gaps currently in academic institutions and how do you uh, expect to address those through these institutes? Well, the whole concept of the institutes, uh, it, it sort of derived, I created something called the Alfred Mann Foundation in 1985 and I see one of our 
distinguished colleagues from that organization here, Dan Merrill, uh, uh, who uh, uh, is here. I, I'm <laughs> pleased, thank you. Uh, but the, the Mann Foundation has been very, very successful. They've created a number of products, have been licensed out. They've earned, oh, I don't know, $150 million or so in, uh, in, uh, in return on their investments, uh, maybe even closer to $200 million. Uh, and uh, uh, so I looked at that. And, and when I fo founded that, by the way, I, what happened is uh, back in the earlier days of my career, I said, you know, uh, when I retire, and I want to give up all this damn management and paperwork and all this stuff. That's not the fun. I want to get back in the laboratory. I was going to hire a dozen or two uh, very qualified engineers and then work in laboratories on various uh, problems. And what happened uh, is that I, you know, I, when I sold the pacemaker company, I had a lot of money. I didn't know what to do with it, so I created the foundation. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's been very successful. So I said, well, now what else can we do? So I said, let's go to universities because academics, if you'll pardon me, don't understand how to get a product to market. They don't understand anything about the business. It's amazing. And so most of the companies that are started by the academic community fail. So I said, we've got to find a solution to that because it's great technology. So I said, we'll create a, an industrial organization on a university campus, hire people who've done it before, and they'll take the technology from the university, the academics will play a minor role in this organization, and will develop the products to a later stage where they create value. Because you can't really create much value in the early stages of a, comp of a product. It's only when you get it uh, well along in the development process and even in clinical trials when you create value. Uh, the, the biggest problem is people sell these things too early and they don't ever realize much out of it. The real value comes later. And when, you know, I've sold uh, uh, various of my companies uh, for close to $8 billion and the reason I've done it is I've, I've invested in it myself and I've been able to create a, a value over time to where we built the value and then sold the companies rather than create, selling the companies and then creating the value. That's the difference. That was the idea of the institutes. Uh, the jury's out. I'm not sure how successful they're going to be. I've created three of them so far. Uh, I was going to create one at, at Hopkins, by the way, but uh, uh, your uh, prior president wasn't too, uh, uh, too interested in it at the time. Uh, maybe now, uh, because, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, pardon? <laughs> anyway. Um, that was the idea, was to try to bridge the so-called valley of death. Next question? Yes, sir? The uh, students we graduated for the next month or so, and uh, the biomedical engineering students and engineering students, and some of them will go into become biomedical uh, engineers, and some will go more into the management track and become entrepreneurs. What advice for them do you have, and what mistakes have you seen, as you've seen four or five cycles of students go through their careers? What kind of mistakes do people make? How can they avoid them? And what advice do you have for them? Well, I refer you back to the talk and remember the 10 important criteria for a company and, and also understand that it's a, you have to have everything in place. Uh, I always will say the most important uh, ingredient you need for success is enough money to do the job. It's not easy in the early stages if you don't have access to it. What's another thing that's been unique about my experience is I've always invested, you know, I sold my, uh, my aerospace companies to Textron in 1960 and then an earn-out deal and I left there in, in uh, 1972. I had enough capital at that point that I was able to invest in the pacemaker company and, and, uh, and uh, when I sold that I had enough money to invest in Minimed and, I, and then, I, you know, on and on with all the things I've done. I usually didn't bring in outside money until the major risks were gone. And then I went to friends, and because I always created a lot of money for them, I had no trouble raising money when I needed it. Uh, but the main thing, make sure you have enough capital get, uh, and make sure you've done your homework. And, of course, you've got to be willing to, to work 20 hours a day. 
which is what I've done over many of my years. I work, uh, you know, I, I always say now I work less than uh, hours per week than my age. I'm 84 years old now. I still work 80 hours a week. <clears throat> yep. Now, uh, Dr. Miner, Dr. Villasanti, and I have had a chance to uh, sit in the front row and watch your cochlear implant remain the market leader with respect to its <coughs> I guess the surprising thing about that is that you've never been challenged with respect to having the fastest, smartest device on the market. I'm wondering what has led to that idea? What has sustained that idea? Is, is it just related to capitalization? Uh, patience and commitment. Uh, you know, I say that you can't win in the battle unless you have the technology uh, so, so that you need to make sure you have something. I mean, when we go up against a Medtronic or a Boston or a Guidant or a, a Coker Corporation or any of these companies, you can't compete with them on the, on the marketing side. So you have to have something that gives you an edge. And the edge in, that I've always found, because again, <coughs> Uh, I still have the, the, the technical beginnings of my, uh, my career is to make sure we produce better technology. Um, the, the challenge we have is, uh, is that sometimes that gets lost, uh, particularly when you have public companies or when you're acquired, some of that gets lost. For example, you wanted the, 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 uh, the artificial pancreas. We actually virtually created that artificial pancreas uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, an implantable system, we had the sensor that lasted about 14 months and we thought we could make it last five years. We had an implantable pump and we had some uh, early stage uh, algorithms for control and we implanted a number of these in, in France mostly. Uh, when Medtronic bought the company, they said, you know, we're in the, in the disposable market. We, uh, you know, we, we want to, uh, all of the disposables to go with the pump. We're not interested in, in, in the implantable thing. It was fascinating. They paid $420 million for the artificial pancreas program, and then they closed it down. So, <clears throat> so. <laughs> but, but on the cochlear implant, the cochlear corporation piece you up. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I started to tell, I didn't tell that story. I should. Yeah. What happened is, remember, I said I was never going to make a business out of it. Coker Corporation came to, we implanted six units in 1991, and the patient did remarkably well, far better than the people that were using the existing system at the time. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, what happened is that uh, uh, the company in the business, Coker Corporation, heard about it, and they came uh, to see me. And they said, we want to buy your company. Uh, and I said, sure, that was what I always planned. Uh, uh, so uh, what do you want to do? What do you want to, uh, you know, what are you proposing? We'll take care of your six patients. And I said, of course you will. And what else? Well, we'll take care of your six patients. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, but we spent all this money developing this technology. What are you going to pay for that? Uh, and they, they said, uh, uh, well... Uh, we, we, uh, it takes a lot to take care of six patients, so uh, we'll just take care of your six patients. I said, you mean you want to, we want us to give you all of this and all you're going to do is take care of these six patients? Six patients are doing exceedingly well. They don't need any help. And I said, no, 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 you can't. I said, okay, thank you, and I got up and walked out, and I walked out the door, uh, and one of my colleagues was with me, and he looked at me and said, I see by the look in your face we're now in the cochlear implant business. And that's how we got in, that's how we formed uh, advanced biotics. <laughs> Time for one more question. Uh, man, thank you very much for your talk. Many of the people in this room are likely to be long, lifelong academicians, so they're not going to have capital, capital, or capital. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to someone like you, trying to get that capital, and looking back at the history of your companies, some of them, like advanced biotics, didn't start with a, a major leadership or management structure in place, and the market at the time was thought to be pretty small. Uh, but you went with them anyway. So what's distinguished in the, all the pitches I'm sure you've had over decades, the ones that you decided to move ahead with? Well, in today's world, 
finding capital is very difficult. Uh, and uh, although there are a lot of venture organizations, more than there should be, frankly, with a lot of money, uh, but uh, they, you know, they have a billion dollars or five hundred million dollars or whatever. They can't afford to make a uh, hundred investments of a million dollars or so. Uh, so they are only interested in investments, typically of twenty-five million or more. Uh, you're not going to get them to give you less than ten million dollars. Uh, so, uh, so if you want to start a venture and you need to get the capital you probably need to find someone who shares your vision, shares your, understands what you're trying to do. They call these people angels. So somebody uh, who is willing to support you, give you a couple of million dollars to get started, uh, and uh, then when you start getting something of substance, then, then uh, uh, sooner or later you're at a point where you've done all of the homework and done all these first five steps that I mentioned in the in the talk, uh, and then maybe you're at a point where uh, you can see a vision for needing 25 or 50 million dollars to get to the market or whatever. At that point, you can go to a venture capitalist and raise the money. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You bet. Yeah.